and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Sri Lanka, the broken. Protest against high income taxes, soaring inflation, skyrocketing food prices, but minuscule income. Living in Sri Lanka has become the most painful experience for its citizens. Today, we are told by the very same leaders who broke our country how to fix it. So naturally, the people have no trust in those very same leaders who are more interested in grabbing power and living a life of luxury. Whether in the government, the opposition or the radical breakaway factions, everyone who has led us has continued to fail us. Amidst this, the president proposes a new way out of the crisis, which feels more like deja vu. To understand Sri Lanka's predicament tonight, I will speak to the Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research, New York, Professor Clara Matei, State Minister of Finance, Shahan Semsingha, Opposition Parliamentarian, Eran Vikramaratna of the Samagi Janabalavege, Parliamentarian from the Breakaway SLPP faction, Dr. Nalaka Godaheva, Former Governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kabra, and Senior Economist, Dr. Kenneth De Silva. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny. And this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone, thank you for your time. Tonight our focus is on Sri Lanka's dying economic situation. So let's get right to it. As we come on the air, Sri Lanka, also known as the Paradise Island, is paralyzed. You may wonder why. The answer is quite simple. Ask the question. It's because of you and me. It's confusing to hear that you and I let this country down when none of us even govern this nation. And there lies the answer. Nor did we go not govern, but we also didn't hold the governing accountable. Today, a narrative is manufactured by a very selected few who schemingly mold it for their benefit. There are many important factors you need to know because this change we are about to experience is the most important thing we as a nation will face in this 11th hour. As of now, Sri Lanka is more divided, less confident and more confused and sadder than it has been in recent living memory. However, despite the doom and gloom, Sri Lanka's problems are fixable. If the economy needs fixing, then we can select the best path forward from the point of view which will benefit Sri Lanka. Likewise, if our society needs fixing, then we can do the same. To fix our problems, we need the full attention of a group of leaders who loves this country. Unfortunately, we don't have that right now. What we have is a group of leaders whom a crafty mind can manipulate, a group of leaders who can be intimidated by difficult circumstances. A group of leaders who believes that we don't have the solutions. The IMF does. A group of leaders who think that we don't understand the problem. The West does. And a group of leaders who believes that we certainly don't have the means of fixing it. America does. Our very own leaders have let us down. And even right now, it is the case. Look at the parliamentary proceedings. Even in this dire situation, you would see what a pathetic sorry state it is in. Unfortunately, our parliamentarians are more interested in an election that we don't need right now. What we need is a consolidated effort by our leaders to fix the broken system that has benefited them for 75 years and harmed us for that many years. Sri Lanka, the paradise, 
is paralyzed. The ones who got us there still continues to take us on that wrong path. And the ones who let it happen, that's you and me, continue to believe in our failed leaders. Perhaps the time is nigh for us to think as Sri Lankan people and not depend on failed leadership. We'll be right back. This is the State of the Nation. Did you manage to catch the opening of the fourth session of the ninth parliament? Did you listen to the throne speech or policy statement of President Rani Vikram Singh? Well, if you didn't, we don't blame you. You didn't miss much. There wasn't anything significant that was already said before. CD Tatiak Matadunna, Gite Matukawa, Rata Hara Noyami, Adamage Kata Vempasu, E Gita Vikasha Naker and Kia, Mama Rupo Hani Nali Kawaling. Illa city no. Pasugia Kale Tulagat Pior and Isa may Pidene Hemin Heming Adukaranda Apata Puluang Vela Tieno. Then Artike Kisiam Stavrek Ativela Tibeno. Artik Arbudakari Avastavaka Uddamani Ialeno. Badumila Vaduino. Rakia Anaturata Patuino. Via Para Kadavatino. Badubara Vaduino. Samaje Sielukota Suelta Jiva Twenta Amari. Namutava Masa Park Hak Ketikalak. May Amaru Vinadara Gatot, Apata Visunumak Pete and Puluang. May system change a Arambiak Pamanai. Apatawat Boho Venas come up Sidukale Utui. Sri Lanka was in gay, Visheshain Taruna Tarunangi Adahasanua, E Venas come, Triatma Kirimata, Apa Bala Portueno. E Nisa Idri Visipa, Vasari Visipatula, Apa Anugamane Kalu to Patipati, Ha Triapilivet, Pilima the Yojana. Idirpat Karan Kia, Mamma Oba Samagem, Illa Sitino. E Ilima Mamma Karane, May Saba Sitino Oba Samagem Vitrak Neme, Mulu Mahat Sri Lanka and Genva. Oba Lanka Vesitiat, Videshaka Sitiat, Obe Adahas Idirpat Karn, Rata Yali, Godanag Vime, Samika Viaya Meta, Ekwan. Oh, what we didn't hear in that speech was a proper concrete plan of getting out of this crisis. What are the steps we can take? Do we have any idea as to how we can overcome this situation? Do we even know how deep we are in this crisis? Instead, all we heard was why he was implementing IMF recommendations and why the IMF is the only way forward. In fact, at one point he did say, if you have a better idea, please let him know. President Ranil Wickremesinghe delivered his State of the Union type of address minutes after U.S. President Joe Biden mumbled some sentences uh, to America in what was called his State of the Union address. If you listen to U.S. President Joe Biden's and Ranil Wickremesinghe's speeches, you will see two leaders in two parts of the world who are very much detached from their people. Now, during the Independence Day message to the nation, President Rani Wickremesinghe said that he is going to present a 25-year plan to revive this nation. But did you hear anything of that sort during his speech to Parliament? As usual, the IMF story keeps coming up. And the President said that we should have gone to the IMF prior, and if we did, we wouldn't have been in such a mess. <laughs> ये आदुरदार्शी तीर न्याक वर्तमान काटे हुए तट बालपाती बिनो इट आमतरो सहाल लाभागत तहक के अनिक एकम पार्षे वाण्य ज्ञातांत्रे मूल्य आरमुदल पमनाय इधरी गामट इधरी गामने यामट हक के ओन सामग ऐतिकरगान्ना पदनव मताय ये हैरेंट आपटे विनत किसुद मार्ग यक्ने हैं अपयान गमन मग विवेचने करन देशपालन पक्ष Venat Vikalpa Margak Atnam Ayame Sabavata Idiripat Karna Lesai. So why didn't we go to the IMF? Who's responsible for not doing so? Going to the IMF or not going to the IMF is government policy. Different governments can take decisions as to what economic decisions they are going to take. Look at the circumstances. During the twenty-eight weeks 
that I was the governor, Sri Lanka raised nearly $4 billion without the IMF. That is why we were able to settle some of the bank's outstandings. We were able to make sure that there were a lot of imports that had to be done were done. We settled the loans and we were able to continue without any bankrupt see being announced. Now, it is 48 weeks since we approached the IMF. We still haven't got one cent. We have got a promise of $2.9 billion over four years, which means about $362 million every six months. Now, if we had approached the IMF at the time that I became the governor, and we had been successful in getting the money the next day itself, that's not possible, but if he, had, if he assumed that way, you would have seen that we could have only have raised $362 million and Sri Lanka would have had only $362 million for the six months from outside because there would have been no other bilateral lender who would have lent money to us. Today, we are struggling to even find $1 from anyone else from outside. So, these are the choices. People can take choices. That's one side of the story. The other side is, when you access the IMF, what are the conditions that you have to meet? We will leave aside the restructuring part for the time being. But even if you leave that aside, there are so many other factors that we need to be looking at. IMF will want certain conditions to be met. The public service to be cut drastically. Now, we have already started that as we all see. Taxes to be raised and very heavy taxes are being imposed now. Then you need to have the pass through of all the prices for petrol, for diesel, for kerosene, for electricity and all that. Can people afford all that? That is one side of it. Then you also have a contracting economy. I can, as you can see now, last year after we have approached the IMF, Sri Lanka contracted by 11 percent. This year also we are expecting to, uh, the economy to contract by at least 4.5 percent. Now in such a contraction of the economy, can real can the real economy sustain itself? How many people are without jobs today? How many, people, how many people's contracts have been suspended? How many construction contracts have been stopped? My answer to this vexed question, there will not be a real right answer, but people will have to weigh the consequences of both decisions. Well, that was the former governor, Ajit Nivad Cabral, responding to why Sri Lankan didn't go to the IMF uh, prior, as mentioned by the president in his policy statement. Now, when analyzing the policy statement, we can see what's to come. Sri Lanka's road towards recovery will be as tough as nails. But if we can't learn from our past mistakes, then what good are we? We all can agree that everyone with a blunt brain in the governing or political sector and almost all the Colombo liberals think that IMF is bay. IMF will kiss us and make our pain go away. So the only way to learn whether their policies will work now is to look at their past actions and what they would mean to us in the future. Mind you, all the policies implemented uh, right now are of what they did in the past, uh, particularly from 2015 to 2019 period. Joining me now uh, from the data board is Danidu Kamasam. Danidu, good to see you once again. Uh, Danidu, now, I know you've been looking at uh, the policies that we had uh, in, from 2015 to 2019, and we see a resurgence of that same policies being implemented right now. So we know it is the IMF, it is the IMF recommendation, the IMF wants us to do these kinds of things. Now, in order to understand what would happen to the country once you implement these policies? We have we have some kind of a reference, which is from 2015 to 2019. I think it was the 16th time that we went to the IMF and tried to implement those uh, plans. So what happened uh, during that particular period of time? I, I'm really uh, surprised that we had to remind people of this, but apparently we have to do that. So what happened? Yes, Amayush, I think uh, the, the reason this is going to come up multiple times is because these kind of na narratives were used by the SLPP to come into power. But hey. that doesn't mean that uh, you know, it doesn't hold any weight. I'm going to quickly go over the exact effect of this violent sort of like taxation, the austerity that took place. Now we saw things like the nation building tax. 
the the value added tax going up we saw a personal income tax and it was a huge complaint we saw a lot of uh, people complaining about inflation during those times as well because the primary motive of the imf was to balance the budget the primary budget and you explain this in the future as well now we see here a massive drop mahesh i'm going to take a closer look at this massive drop because this is the year we are, we just wanted to show from 2000 to 2020 this massive drop when you take a closer look we see that these are the years between when the when the government as you when the new government came into play with the rhetoric of you know stolen money and everything you are talking about 20 2015 to 2019 exactly. we're talking about the good governance the good governance that was exactly their narrative so with these policies we expect at least to you know have a certain flat line we didn't see a flat line the gdp the real gdp growth taken from the central bank mahesh shows that the the total product the products and services the total of that has consistently gone down so now the taxation is far more violent we might see something worse indeed um, this happened like what 6 7 years ago uh, and we still have to keep reminding people what happened back in 2015 the pay tax we saw a lot of protests uh, we i mean i don't know whether people remember the uh, the time that the whole golf phase was filled with protesters back then what were they uh, protesting at that time uh, high cost of living pay taxes unbearable taxes all that and we are seeing a very much of the same happening right now and it's sad that people keep forgetting but i guess that's why we are here that indu to remind them all right that is with our some other data board so let's get reactions to the president's policy statement joining me now is the uh, state minister of finance shan semasinga minister thank you very much for your time uh, good to see you once again now what is your reaction minister to the president's policy statement i know you are part of the government but what was said is mostly against the narrative of what the sri lanka podu jana peramuna campaign for back in 2019 now do you agree with the policy statement of the current president and if so do you then agree that your policies pitch back in 2019 were wrong uh, my is a good question actually uh, it's a bit hard question to answer also if we look at from uh, conventional political ideology what you are saying could be right but i think we have to move away from that uh, political ideology because uh, in sri lanka uh, things are different now one uh, the main crisis we are going through the economic crisis and then uh, the expectations of uh, the youth of this country and how we build confidence and make sure that all contribute uh, to uphold the economy and uh, to retain in sri lanka so when you uh, see the present uh, issues we are facing and the global impacts we have i think uh, in my view the president uh, gave the right path and the correct picture of what sort of a economic crisis we are in we all know that uh, we are trying to come out of this crisis and everybody is hoping the majority is uh, hoping that we'll come out of this crisis as early as possible but there is a major uh, there is a minority uh, which thinks uh, their political ideology can be established on grassroots level if this crisis continues for a further 6 to 6 months or more, more than that so uh, economy is uh, becoming uh, stabilized not the ideal stabilization that we want to have but uh, you know people are, are not suffering the way they used to suffer about 6 uh, 7 months back so if you look at the policy statement and uh, and you were talking also about uh, what we campaigned in 2019 yes things are different now so we have to adapt to the changes and uh, make sure that we all get together uh, keep aside our political uh, mismatches all get together and make sure that people get confidence that the country will come back to a normal uh, uh, a uh, livable country so this is what our intention is and anybody who is trying to disturb this taking small uh, political ideologies will only make sure the country will go from bad to us indeed i uh, understood uh, minister uh, since i have you here uh, where are we with regard to the imf bailout plan the bailout plan seems to have the balagiri dosha or something it's not today it's tomorrow kind of situation well uh, I don't agree with you on that. Uh, the reason is it's a very complex process. 
I mean IMF process just do, does not focus only on giving this bailout package and uh, ensuring we get the lost confidence from the rest of the world and access to the capital markets. It, it goes beyond that. You know, to, to for this bailout package to be executed, there are a lot of adjustments that we have to do within our system. Uh, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy and all the other aspects of accountability and how do we ensure uh, that you know this kind of a, a repeat story will not take place back in the country. So you know it is a very complex process, it is a lengthy process. Why it is complex and lengthy is to ensure that you know all, uh, all member states are, uh, are not affected by, uh, by a deviation of a decision of one country. So, we have now uh, got uh, financial assurances from the Paris club including Japan and the US and uh, their members. We have got the assurances from India and uh, the bondholders have given their assurances to, uh, to uh, the IMF. China, the Exim Bank has given assurance. Of course, uh, there are bilateral discussions taking place and there are further requirements to be fulfilled. So, if you take the prior actions in uh, getting the economy stabilized and thereafter from 2025 to look at a growth, we have done fiscal adjustments. I know those adjustments are, uh, I mean quite uh, difficult adjustments for a political party or a leader or a government to take because none of those uh, decisions will make the government popular. It will make the government unpopular. But however, if somebody uh, is not willing to take this uh, challenge and take the country back on track, the country will go, it will be a disastrous situation in the future. So, so we, have, uh, we are doing this and we are very confident that by within the first quarter that we should get the uh, approvals of the IMF executive board. That means, we will have access back to the market and we will be uh, accepted by rest of the world uh, and we can march forward. Uh, keeping out all what happened in the past and look at a new uh, present and a future. All right, uh, State Minister of Finance, Shahan Sam Singh, uh, we have to leave it, at that. leave it at that. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so what does the opposition think about the policy statement? Yes, you are right. They disagree. This is not groundbreaking stuff. The government has focused only on revenue and unfortunately in increasing taxes, they have squeezed the middle class particularly the low middle class and the tax free threshold basically needs to be increased. We have been making that point from the beginning because why do you want to create another dependent class out of people who are going daily to work, they are taking care of themselves, their families, their children, their grandparents and are not dependent on the state and that is why we have asked them to increase that. Uh, yesterday the president referred to and said that will cost 63 billion rupees. First is I contest the number of 63 billion rupees and there are ways of actually making that number because we are not saying that you shouldn't be taxing. We stand with that principle but we, then we will obviously have to tax those at the higher income rates but we have to protect those in the middle so that life can go on. We can't solve one problem by creating another problem. The other issue is that the president never referred to the issue of expenditure. You know if you are running a home, you are running a business, if there is a crisis the first thing you look at is expenditure. No mention of expenditure. We have an inefficient public service, everybody knows that. We are in the ICU as an economy and as a people, we are in the ICU. That throne speech did not address it. Well, that was the member of the Samagi Janabala Vega, parliamentarian Iran Vikram Ravna with uh, the opposition's rebuttal to President Vikram Singh's policy statement. Now, there is another faction, I am curious to know what they think. The very same people who brought the former president to power and now have managed to form a breakaway faction of their own. Joining me now is uh, former Minister of Mass Media, Dr. Nalaka Gudeheva, and now part of the Sri Lanka Pudjana Peramuna's rebel faction, the Freedom People's Alliance. Dr. Gudeheva was very much instrumental in the economic narrative of former President Gotabe Rajpaksa. He joins me now uh, to give his take on the current president's uh, way forward. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak to me. Uh, doctor, good to see you. Um, I want you your take 
uh, on the president's policy statement delivered last week. Now, what do you have to say about the, uh, the vision he's proposing and the path uh, he plans for this country? Now, according to your sound economic mind, are we on the right track? Mahesh, thank you very much. When you talk of President's vision, I think you are referring to his this week's vision. Because his vision changes all the time. He's very famous for not just throne speech, the policy statements. I remember 2015-2019, uh, this uh, person as Prime Minister presented 10 different policy statements. Now he has started the same practice once again. Now uh, within 6-7 uh, months of his coming to pre as President, now he's making I think third statement like this. So his this week's statement is also another waste of time as far as I'm concerned. There's absolutely nothing in that. Um, doctor, it's a little bit contradictory. You and your former party, the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, were given all the power by the people of this country back in 2019. You clearly had everything, but couldn't manage to deliver. So why should we believe what you have to say right now when you were given the opportunity, you couldn't do it. But when someone else is trying to do it, you have the usual politics at play and opposes it. Is it really fair that you are now criticizing the current president's policy and his government? First of all, the current president's policies are not our policies. He is a guy whom we rejected all the time. We actually fought against his regime in 2019 and also in 2020 uh, parliamentary election and we rejected him. And people rejected him outright. He couldn't even win, he, win his seat. So now the party that I represented is supporting him to be the president and dictate the policies of the country. So definitely they are not the policies that we promised the people in 2019 and 2020. And the problem that we had between 2019 up to uh, 22 to uh, mid was that the president Gotabi Rajapaksha and his cabinet did not implement what we were promising. We presented a policy statement to the country uh, which was not implemented because it was handed over to a different people, different set of people who never believed in, in that policy. The economic management team of Gotabi Rajapaksha's uh, government is not the one who developed the policy. So I don't think anybody can blame the policy. It is merely because the policy was not implemented that he had to go. All right, uh, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the former Minister of Mass Media and member of the Freedom People's Alliance, Dr. Nalika Gudehewa. We're going to take a short commercial break. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now last week alone, over seven protests against the increase of taxes on income. If only we could learn from the past and understand that we are applying the same butter on the same toast with the same jam, and basically we are getting the same jam sandwich, despite us wanting to get a steak sandwich. Masih kawal rupiah hatta di dahas panse ekat wedi moli kawat tupak upaya naput galai inte pasuge kalle di badu gavi mat sedu na mud mebar silu di mana sahih tawa masih kawal rupiah lakshy ekat wada upaya ne nam nawa ayve yojana anu badu gavi mat sedu bana wak rupiah lakshy tis hat wedi warshika ada ayak hemi kam kene put galai ek moli kawat lakshy dolaha harunu bete wedi bana lakshy visihatar ekat wedi sam mudal lakshan ham se ekat visihatar ekat badu pratishat ayak raja ekat gavi yotu bawa nawa badu sancho dhan yojana awal sanahan did you think that was about taxes being implemented right now? I'm sorry to say that was a clip, a news clip back from 2015, meaning this same formula was implemented back in 2015. And just like what we showed you on the data board, the result of the nation's growth will surely decline. Expect that very soon to happen. The IMF solution is to tax the people, increase the government's profits and balance the primary account. Does this work? 
Joining me now is the Assistant Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research in New York, Professor Clara Matei. She joins me now via Zoom uh, from New York. Professor Matei recently authored the book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. So firstly, Professor, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, good to see you. Now, the current solution to Sri Lanka's crisis, which the IMF has proposed, is to increase taxes and basically kill the middle class. According to you, Professor, is that going to work? Many thanks. Um, will it work? This is uh, the way of posing the question that we should start challenging in the sense that austerity will work uh, for those in power, for the wealthy, for the few, and it will not work uh, for the majority, for well, the well-being of the Sri Lankans, for the, for the two, 22 million people in rural areas who are struggling to put food on the table as it is right now in, in your country. So this is the big question, is to really be able to repoliticize the message coming from these supposedly very technical and authoritative institutions like the IMF. The message of economists uh, advising governments is not a neutral message. It is cloaked as a non-political science, as something above part that has the objective truth of everyone. But really, we know that what they're aiming at is shifting resources from the majority to the minority. So the proposal of uh, increasing taxes on the majority is very symbolic, emblematic of the real project of austerity, because regressive taxation is a kernel of the austerity package. Regressive taxation means that while the few are taxed less, the money comes from the sacrifice of the majority. So I know now they're trying to increase the, uh, the, the, the they're trying to increase the pool of who's being taxed to cover the the poor, and at the same time they're um, really also increasing the cost of ultimately of indirect taxation because they're taking away subsidies and it becomes more costly to actually purchase the common necessities. So we see here that fiscal austerity in the form of, form of regressive taxation is one of a very important series of policies that serve to disempower the people, to silence the demands for social change. Uh, indeed, um, that's very much uh, enlightening uh, of what you said, uh, Professor. Now, uh, since, uh, I I'm pretty sure you have witnessed a negative impact on countries uh, through austerity, which you have clearly outlined in your book. Now, my reference is uh, specifically to emerging economies like Sri Lanka. Why would organizations such as, this is, this is the biggest question that I have, why would organizations such as the IMF propose such hefty cuts on public spending and hikes in um, government revenue? What, what is the reason they, ke they keep saying this over and over again when we really know it won't work in countries like Sri Lanka? Cuts in public spending is the other face of the medal of fiscal austerity. We talked about increasing regressive taxation. And the second part is the state cutting, especially on social expenditures. So once more, what is being done is the urge to increase the market dependence of the majority, increase the precariousness of the population. So they depend more and more on money in their pocket in order to survive because it you, you cut public schools, public, uh, uh, public um, health care, public transport. This will all make it such that we will be more and more forced as the majority to go and work for a low wage in order to make a living. So this is really what austerity is good at. This is how austerity is successful. It's successful at making sure that the majority accepts their condition as exploited wage workers. Um, and so this is what we really need to realize is that once more, austerity is not a neutral necessity. It's not a recipe that we should just take for granted as something that it will do the good of the whole. 
It is doing the good of foreign creditors. Right? The IMS is IMF is playing the advocacy of those who will gain by having Sri Lankans take money from their pocket and through taxes, ultimately ending up in the uh, large international institutions who lend money to the country. Indeed, um, very much uh, uh, in agreement. Uh, Professor, uh, if austerity is not the solution, then what is the solution? How can a country facing such a complex economic crisis like Sri Lanka is facing right now overcome it? Thank you. So I wrote the capital order that I have right here um, to historicize what I've been saying so far. Um, I show concretely how austerity is not just a problem of the south of the globe. It's actually a recipe that is played within uh, the north to kill political upheavals and alternatives to economic democracies that were emerging, for example, after the First World War in 1919. So once we realize, as I do, and as I explain very clearly in my book, that austerity is about silencing alternatives, um, what we need to do is actually be more imaginative about these alternatives, right? So while austerity serves to basically curtail our political imagination, the first opposition from us has to be to actually avoid naturalizing capitalism as the austerity dogmas has us do. Capitalism, the capitalist market economies are not the only way we can run society. It's a very young economic system. Advanced capitalism is really only have been on the planet for 0.1% of the time human beings have been on earth. And for the rest of the time already in the past, but potentials in the future, we can really reimagine gaining agency as producers, bringing back the democratic decision-making in the production process, in the agricultural, agriculture, in industry. So I think what Sri Lanka needs is really to say stop to this dependence from foreign investors and take back economic sovereignty, putting at the center though, no, not the elite in the country, but the people, right? Um, because the elite of the country, of course, are playing the game of the international elite, of the elite in the North. So we need to take back ownership of our means of production and organize production democratically. There is a lot of this being done in the peasantry in Sri Lanka. I have a good student of mine who actually studies these processes and how actually these, these um, self-governing councils in production are also much more ecologically sustainable in a moment in which we are facing a climate catastrophe. So I would say I would give voice to the people, go and explore what is actually happening and make this into a new movement that says enough of thinking that we can only have capitalism and there is no alternative. There are alternatives. And my book shows very well the many alternatives that had emerged after the First World War and how austerity, of course, constantly functions to defeat these alternatives. And this is why we need to read it as what it is, not as a neutral message, but as a political unilateral war, one-sided war against the people that comes from the elite of the globe and that needs to be opposed. Indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research in New York, Professor Clara Mate. Appreciate your time, Professor. Let's take a short commercial break. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, a paper published way back in 2017 by the Political Economic Research Institute in the United States showed how the IMF's programs undermine the ability of governments in developing countries to govern themselves properly. It means that behind the scenes, by keeping you and me in the dark, the IMF imposes hundreds and thousands of structural adjustment plans on countries like Sri Lanka before they ever give us a cent. Even uh, Minister of the State Minister of Finance, Shahan Semasinghe, just a short while ago, admitted to that. For this bailout package to be executed, there are a lot of adjustments that we have to do within our system. Uh, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy and all the other aspects of accountability and how do we ensure uh, that you know this kind of a, uh, repeat story will not take place back in the country. So you know it's a very complex process. Now these plans are geared to guarantee the lenders of this country that their money is safe and more importantly in case of a bust economy just like what's happening right now the lenders will get paid. In better terms, you and I, who live in, in this country, will go to hell while the debtors will have a good time. However, despite this, the IMF has successfully promoted their way of working, uh, mainly through arm twisting and cor cornering nations like Sri Lanka to accept their demands, mainly out of desperation. Well, joining me now is Senior Economist Dr. Kenneth De Silva to talk about this subject. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time. Appreciate it. Now, the government uh, of Sri Lanka is currently pursuing the IMF deal as the Alpha and Omega solution to overcome this uh, economic crisis. However, uh, among several issues that even you and I have discussed uh, with the proposal of the IMF, uh, one key issue is that the Political Economic Research Institute had highlighted, which I just uh, brought, brought out to you, was that the IMF policies actually enhances corruption in developing countries, especially with the so-called structural adjustments. What are your thoughts on that, Prof. Uh, doctor? Good evening, Mahesh. Good to be back on the program. Thanks for the invite. Uh, well, I mean, the research paper is quite evident. Uh, I mean, there are multiple papers that have been written. In fact, the Hoover Institute, uh, uh, in an essay uh, titled The Case Against the IMF, written back in 1999, is a classic example of what's gone wrong with the IMF. There is a very good example where the IMF had distributed loans to 89 countries as part of their structural adjustment program. And out of that 89 countries, 54%, 48 countries had failed in terms of making any progress uh, in, in, in recipient of that particular structural adjustment program. And there is significant critique against the IMF, uh, particularly uh, in with regard to its managing the overall economies of less developed countries. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of uh, the question, I think uh, uh, we find uh, as part of the overall structural adjustment program, uh, key components of that are questionable, particularly when it comes to the privatization of uh, uh, utilities, state assets. Uh, in fact, Sri Lanka is a classic example. Back in 1994, I think, when President Chandrika Kumarutunga was there, uh, I think many of the state-owned enterprises were privatized. And there is a lot of uh, uh, doubt and uh, uh, a lot of uh, shroud uh, uh, behind uh, some of these privatizations. And that's the nature of uh, the IMF uh, program, I guess, in terms of uh, getting on with uh, what they have to do in terms of addressing the balance of payments. Uh, so we have to uh, be cognizant of how we deal with it going forward. Well, doctor, uh, do you believe the structural adjustments uh, that the IMF is propose proposing are actually the interest of a foreign nation, thereby effectively undermining democracy in Sri Lanka? Or is there an actual requirement in Sri Lanka to heighten taxes and impose substantial tariff for the country to recover? Right. Uh, in terms of the overall structural adjustment program, which is also a broader uh, a part of the overall Washington consensus, uh, we find there are typically four key remedies uh, dished out to uh, developing countries. 
and this has not changed since 1965. In fact, it's it's resurfaced back again in the uh, current staff level agreement and the Article 4 agreement that the government of Sri Lanka has signed. Uh, so, four particular areas is one is uh, privatization as we spoke about earlier. Uh, so, cutting down government expenditure as part of that whole program, uh, looking at the revenue side. Uh, secondly, is basically having free markets and financial deepening, which means that the currency has to be let loose uh, and also a more uh, market market based uh, economic model. Uh, thirdly, you find uh, the fiscal adjustment, which is taxes, which is part of your question. Uh, has have to be increased in terms of to balance the overall budget and fourthly you have to have uh, a framework of governance in place which also entails that the government has to move away from uh, subsidy and have a market based pricing mechanism uh, so all these four p uh, points uh, nothing new to, to uh, say the least uh, are, are painful adjustments and uh, in fact uh, you will find people like uh, Joseph Stiglitz and uh, uh, Nobel laureate Jeffrey Sachs have been very critical about uh, this particular structural adjustment program and, uh, and how it has created more poverty and more pain and great austerity in countries. All right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you. That was senior economist Dr. Kenneth De Silva. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Last year, Sri Lanka faced one of the worst crises it had to go through purely because of years of mismanagement by consecutive governments. We are to be blamed for that situation, for letting our leaders play us and have our country fall to its knees. In such a situation, as we see in most scenarios of weaknesses, the vultures combine and come after anything that is left. It was at that point that we saw a so-called people's protest being pitched to chase away a democratically elected president. It's true, he didn't do his job, but it's not the way you chase him out of office. You use the voice of the people through a ballot. That is what the West has been teaching us. The objective was to create chaos and show the world the side of Sri Lanka that even we didn't know existed. Now, after a detailed analysis and the development of hindsight, we learn that it was never a people's protest, but an elaborated theatrical release by the best puppet masters in the business. The marionettes were the innocent Sri Lankan people who got fooled alongside a president who got hoodwinked. We saw in the days leading up to President Gotabe's uh, shameful resignation that a particular ambassador played the role of the mediator and meeting the president on one day and motivating the protesters on another and simply having a fun time while serving her nation's interest, playing with the lives of millions of Sri Lankans. With this control, where both the protesters and the establishment that it is being protested against were being played by the same hand. Now for decades, they have been trying to get Sri Lanka to kneel. And the only blockade was the patriotic people of this country. So that's why it was vital to get the patriotic people that were powerful to elect a leader with the highest number of votes alongside a two-thirds majority in parliament to dismantle and ruin its reputation. Better yet, get them to default, go to the IMF, and severely damage our relationship with countries we have worked with for decades. Who really tried to orchestrate this? Who really can be this puppet master? Last summer, the Sri Lankan people made clear their desire for a cleaner, more accountable government 
and a more prosperous and inclusive democracy here. The U.S. is proud to be Sri Lanka's partner as you do the hard work, and we know it is hard work, to secure the future that all Sri Lankans deserve. Wrapped with the heartiest of smiles to tell Sri Lankans that Big Mama Nulan sees you and she will always be there for you. Anyway, my point is very simple. We need a leader that puts Sri Lanka's interests above all else. And if we cannot find that leader, we have to become that leader for the betterment of our country. On a programming note, make sure that you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. This week, our conversation is about Sri Lanka's 75 years of legacy. A State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us at Other Dera 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday. <laughs>